Coming up, with a bevy of weapons at Jalen Hurts' disposal, we take a look at how that shoulder for the Philadelphia Eagles signal caller could be the X factor for the Giants in their second playoff game of the postseason, how Wink Martindale may bring some different looks to the defensive side of the ball, and ultimately, what Big Blue may do to throw off this Eagles offense. Ah, yes, my friends, it's OGP, the One Giant Podcast, where we are your hosts over here, Adam Armbrecht, over there, Andrew Makowitz. Let's just dispense with the healthy, wealthy, and wise, Andy, because uh, yeah, I know you're not, and I was going to come in with my own little tale of woe, but there's just no reason to bother as the Giants are preparing for their second postseason playoff game against those Philadelphia Eagles. You know, Adam, very simply, I think we can all agree, going to the dentist is one of like the worst experiences you can ever have. Even even the dentist could be like the greatest person that you've ever seen. Nice, great bedside manner. Everything could be great. But the second they're like, does this hurt? And you feel the drill drilling into, into your mouth. You just know that it's going to hit a nerve at some point. I am just an anti-dentist type of person. I'm just going to tell you no. that right now. That's why I'm going. Um, I'm going to go with the all wooden teeth. Eventually, mm. I think it's just a smarter move. You get a nice little lacquer on there, and um, you know, it, it's, I think it's a good. It's a good festive. You go for the holidays. You do different things. Doesn't matter. Bottom line, um, we're all playing a little bit injured here, and as is maybe Jalen Hurts. And we said we want to come in and discuss some of the key matchups for the Giants coming into this game against the Philadelphia Eagles. Third time that they're going to meet this season. Obviously, three. NFC East teams are in the playoffs right now uh, as we look across the uh, NFL spectrum. But the really the biggest factor here is Jalen Hurts and his shoulder because the update around him, he was asked at practice, looked over the Philadelphia Inquirer, said, yeah, feels good. I, I, I'm going to assume that whenever their postseason ends, obviously after Saturday night against the Giants, that you'll probably hear something come out about how severe the injury was, what he was trying to manage, because we've seen the stark contrast between how potent this offense looked early in the season, and then effectively, from right around the time when you felt like he had a shoulder injury, things have looked a little bit more difficult for them. Are you bullish at the idea that maybe Jalen Hurts is going to once again be playing a little bit dinged up here, or do you think that the bye week, the time off, and maybe some gamesmanship is trying to lull Big Blue? Well, Adam, listen. The injury reports came out. There was four Philadelphia Eagles on it. Avante yeah. Maddox was a did not participate, uh, had a toe injury. You had Lane Johnson, Linval Joseph, and Robert Quinn that were all limited participants. Jalen Hurts was not listed on the injury report whatsoever. And you know what, Adam? No team in the history of the NFL has ever manipulated the injury no. report no. in any way, shape, or form. So I'm going to go with Jalen Hurts is fully healthy. And you know what? If and when the Eagles lose to the Giants come this upcoming Saturday, I want zero excuses about Jalen Hurts' shoulder hurting because guess what? You have every opportunity to put him on the injury report, say that he's dinged up, do all these different things. You know, it's as, to your point, it's only going to come out afterwards and they're going to say, man, uh, mark my words. They will come out and say, any other person in any other job would have been out months with the same injury that Jalen Hurts did. And you know that that, this, that it's exactly how it's going to happen, yet they don't have him listed on the injury report. Pretty interesting how that works, right? Yeah, and it's interesting, I guess, you know, from a giant standpoint, you'd say, hey, listen, like, the fact that he's not being listed, that if so it's like the, the two sides of your head, right? It's like, well, maybe that's gamesmanship because he has been dinged up for so long and they're trying to send the message that he's going to be fine. It's going to be a full go. So when we look inside of this, though, this is why I found it interesting. You go back, and even in that first meeting with them, 48 to 22, like we all know, it was not what you call a shining moment for the New York football giants. But 21 to 31 in that game, 217 yards, had the two touchdowns, 84.7 QBR, like played obviously very well in that game. He also contributed seven rushes for 77 yards in so many ways. That stat line looks very similar to what we've been getting from Daniel Jones, right? Give me 200 plus, unless you're going back to the first playoff game. Where we're saying, no, you know what, man? I'm more of a 300 yard kind of guy. I'm kind of like a, you know, really beat you up in all phases kind of quarterback these days. But this is where I think it becomes interesting. 
So if his shoulder is a problem, when you look at this, who do you think is the most dangerous weapon that the Giants have to contend with on the offense for the Eagles? Because we know that they have A.J. Brown, and they have Devonta Smith, and they have Miles Sanders. And you can even worry about, at least to a low level, Boston Scott just because it is propensity to score touchdowns against the Giants. But does Jalen Hurts' shoulder change who you think is the biggest concern and what the Giants need to focus in on defensively? No, it really doesn't change much for me, Adam, because it's his non-throwing shoulder. I think that's the yeah. most important distinction that you have to have. He's not going to have issues pushing the ball down the field the way he normally does. Now, we can all agree that he's not the most accurate downfield um, threat when he's throwing the football, but he did improve dramatically this year uh, over the last couple of years where the knock was he's not really that accurate. You know, it, it's tough because you watch the two-headed monster at the wide receiver core of A.J. Brown and Devonta Smith – when the Giants got blown out by 28 points, both of them had their moments, showed flashes. I just yeah. remember the Julian Love play where like he goes up inexplicably trying to catch the ball on fourth down when if he just gets a fingertip on it, it would have been over. Devonta Smith walks in the end zone for a touchdown. To me, it feels like it feels like there's there's two things. One is you have to eliminate as much as possible Jalen Hurts's improvisation scramble ability. That, to me, is still number one. Now, if his shoulder's a little dinged up, maybe they don't utilize that as much as they have been. Um, I really think that he's the engine that does everything for this team, and you saw it when he was out. The other one is A.J. Brown. Every time A.J. Brown gets behind a defense or scores a big touchdown, it feels like it changes the momentum of the game. Like mm -hmm. He is the alpha number one wide receiver that they went out and got in the offseason, and he has done everything to solidify himself as that true number one, because every time he scores, as I mentioned, the momentum feels like it changes or it's like soul crushing when defenses are like, we're focusing on AJ Brown and he's still beating us. Yeah. I think it's weird too. Like, it's funny because you mentioned it being the off shoulder. And, and this is the part that I think maybe is a little bit from a Philadelphia Eagles standpoint, trying to put this kind of lens on the back end of their season. There's two sides to it. The one side is like, well, they won all their games down the stretch. So it's not like they weren't winning. They didn't look as dominant. They didn't look like they did early in the season. But I do wonder if it's just like a little bit of this kind of like this built in excuse around like, ah, oh, why have you struggled a little bit? Because you go back and look at Jalen Hurts numbers. And for the most part, he has over 300 yard games mixed in there. There's the lull. The big one for me is when you go back and look at Washington, Indy and Green Bay. They lost that game against Washington. But that's where he only threw for 175, 190, 153. You take out those three games. And by and large, his stats have been consistent throughout the season. The QBR was ugly for the last two games of the year, games that they needed to win and still managed to get that number one seed uh, in that process. So it, it, it's it's interesting to think about it from that standpoint. You mentioned A.J. Brown. I, you know, it's so weird, man. When I look over, because we're going to talk about the Giants defensively and some of the things that Wink Martindale has done, and I'm going to ask you a, a very bold question about this upcoming game. But when I went over and looked at the stats, like, it's pretty nuts that when you go in on the Philadelphia Eagles and go into their wide receiver room and look at a guy like Devonta, like Devonta Smith, there's only been, he had 13 games this season and he had an offer to start the year. I think everyone remembers that at least if you're a, uh, if you were an Eagles fan, because I think he had four or five targets, couldn't catch a single ball, but you go inside of his season, man, 13 out of 17 games, he had at least five catches for the Philadelphia Eagles. And you go back and you track them. Some of the numbers aren't that high in terms of yardage, right? These little chunk plays, getting him in space, trying to have the little run after the catch opportunities. But man, go back to the Tennessee game in December there on December 4th. Going forward from there, 102, 64, 126, 113, 115, and 67 yards in that season finale against the New York football giants. I worry about when I look at it, and I, what was he at? What did he have the last time these two teams met? Five catches, eight targets, 64 yards. So very similar lines, seven for 67 in the season finale. I know that maybe seeing him in those two meetings makes you feel like an A.J. Brown is the number one. I do worry about, though, how explosive and quick he can be and looking inside the Giants secondary and saying, do we feel confident about the second or third man that needs to step up and defend against Devontae Smith and it makes it interesting when we talk about the percentages of how Wink Martindale has approached the defensive side of the ball and some of the dramatic changes that he made from the regular season going into that first game, obviously, against the Minnesota Vikings. 
Well, I think the first thing that's noteworthy is to think about the the personnel differences that the Giants have now. When they get back at Dory Jackson, we saw his impact against a guy like Justin Jefferson yep. right out of the gate. You know, obviously getting his feet underneath him, first series, not great. Rest of the game, he bottled him up for three catches and under 25 yards. Like that was a, an A plus effort by that defense to take him away. I think obviously the addition of Xavier McKinney coming back after he had his hand injury. That has been tremendous for this secondary, and and it's been that bend don't break. You saw Xavier McKinney all over the field against the Vikings. Yeah. Like you, the the presence of both of those players was felt throughout the game. And while that defense was giving up chunk plays, you kind of said, "Could you imagine what this would look like without those two players?" And then I think I'm like, "Oh, it would look like the Eagles game where they gave up 48 points. Like that's what it would basically look like when those guys aren't out there." And and that's the big difference to me is having those two players in those positions now allows Wink Martindale to be more creative and actually scheme up different things. When you have little to no talent, you're just hoping maybe you just bring the house and they make mistakes. When you have the talent back there, you can say, maybe let's play some circumstance and and situational football. That'll put us in a better chance to win. And he did that. uh, He did that on uh, Sunday against the Vikings. Yeah, I agree with you. And I know we have the percentages we're going to talk about here. And then the other thing is, so this is the kind of the, the interesting question I have about it. And I want to get up. I was looking back into the cornerback room for that week 18 performance. So it's still McLeod. It's still Pinnock. But Cordell Flott in that week 18 game played 72 snaps, 99% of the defensive snaps Cordell Flott. Because my question was going to be, one, first and foremost, as we just make a little adjustment there, no big deal. Um is one, who is the second best corner on the New York football giants? Now that you're healthy, now that you have McKinney back, now that you have a Dory Jackson out there, you feel like the secondary is certainly stronger. But I think, or I'm interested about, the end of the Minnesota Vikings game, Cordell Flock coming in for a key sequence and playing well, he's easily the guy that has the length and has the speed. He doesn't have the experience but do you think that, that week 18 performance by this team, by this Giants team that didn't have any other starters out there primarily can influence how Wink Martindale looks at defending against the Eagles team in this matchup? Because that's where I look at. I look at Cordell Flott, and I even do think a little bit about Dane Belton if we believe that Xavier McKinney is going to need to be everywhere, all over, and picking up some different assignments, much like he did in the closing moments, being put <coughs> man-to-man against TJ Hawkinson and knowing he was the only guy that was going to be there to make that stop. Yeah, so I think that you're going to see a drastically different defense against the Philadelphia Eagles than what you saw against the Minnesota Vikings, and that shows the adaptability that Wink Martindale has. Well, what what you saw against the Minnesota Vikings, Adam, was different than what you saw all year from the Giants, and that's why it shows that you can continually change up this defense. We'll get into the stats, as you mentioned. I want to get to them. You talked about who the second-best cornerback is. Obviously, Fabian Moreau, when he came in, looked like he was solidifying himself as that second cornerback. You know, the play of recent has not been great for Fabian Moreau. It's it's certainly tailed off since the beginning. Maybe there's more tape on him. Maybe teams are scheming up against him. Uh, against the Eagles that first go around, he had a couple times where he did get burned. It's tough. You're, 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 he's coming off the street, basically, jumping, you know, thrust right into some games for the Giants. You know, I do think it's Cordell Flott. You know, his his pro football focus group rating is in, is 65. He's, you know, uh, probably second on the team in that rating. I know it's not the be all end all, but he has the length, he has the energy and he has the athleticism to be able to make plays. And a guy like Devonta Smith is not the big bruising, big bodied wide receiver yeah. where you'd be yeah. worried that Cordell Flott can't match up with him one on one. Now, Devonta Smith is a great wide receiver and is a little bit taller and can, and can go up and make plays. But I would be much more concerned if it was Cordell Flott versus A.J. Brown when A.J. Brown gets a bubble screen or something and he has the physicality to overtake some of the deficiencies that a guy like Flott has. Yeah, so again, I mean, listen, I don't know. Maybe you get out there and you see three snaps for Cordell Flott, but we talked about this coming out of the Minnesota Vikings game, going into it as well, about the reps you had during the year, how it can build up to some opportunities. This is, I think, a part of Wink Martindale's process is showing things that teams don't have enough tape on. Because Cordell Flott didn't play all year, right? Or because Dame Felton didn't play as much during the season. So I will not be surprised 
if Cordell Flott is out there for a lot of key sequences, could be a part of a rotational package. We saw Rodarius Williams in that Week 18 game as well. He did not look nearly as consistent, even though we are fond of him as a player, as a young player inside this team. I think that Cordell Flott has a real role potentially on the defensive side here, especially if your first line of attack could be saying, hey, Adoree Jackson, go lock up with A.J. Brown, follow him all around the field, and we'll build from there. The other part of this is those percentages we talked about and the Giants switching to a quarters defense in a much larger way than they ever had throughout the season. Yeah, Nick Filato, uh pulled some of this from PFF on Twitter. I just consolidated, so shout out for making it easy for guys like us to just be able to pull the stats. Um, uh, the quarter, so quarter defense is basically when you when you put four players back and you be, and essentially what you're saying is it's almost like a prevent defense. It's almost like no matter what you do, you will not take the top off of us on any of these plays whatsoever. If you ever get beat over the top playing quarters, something has gone drastically you wrong and someone should be huge mistake <laughs> fired immediately because you have four right. guys that are basically sitting back there trying to prevent that. Yeah. So the Giants only played quarters 15.9% of the time. Four, de four defensive back backs back seven on the field all at one time. They only did that 15.9% of the time during the regular season in this game. They did it 48% of the time, Adam, they basically did it half the time putting people back. And it goes towards what we talked about before. Justin Jefferson is the home run hitter that takes the top off of the defense. And every time he breaks one of those big plays off, you're putting that offense back on the field and you're applying pressure. What they said was, we're going to give you the underneath plays to TJ Hawkinson He's going to eat. He's going to get his receptions. He's going to do everything he wants to do underneath. We're not going to give you the quick hitting touchdowns. You're going to have to go through us methodically. And it ended up being successful for the Giants. Changing that up, saying keep everything underneath us, was a successful strategy that paid off for Wink. Yeah, and you know what's interesting about it too, it's like I wonder what the influence there was when Aziz Ojalari goes out, right? Because if you're talking about, well... I may go into a little bit more, man. I may want to throw some more blitzes at this team. But now that I know my blitzers are that much more diminished, I need to try to balance the books here. And I think it's a good strategy to switch to it. And as we said all year, the Giants have, have done a consistently good job of not allowing the home run hits to get over the top of them, regardless of what scheme they're running. Keep the safeties back there. They keep the plays primarily in front of them. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, so when you think about how they switched up quarters versus what they what they normally run, they did three times the amount of quarter defense than they do in the regular season, which is a crazy number in the playoffs. You mentioned Aziz Ojolari going out. He also said, if we bring pressure, then we don't have enough players to bracket Justin Jefferson and yep. some of the wide receivers on the outside. So he really, uh, and it shows from the blitz packages, Wink blitzed 22.5% of the time. So between one out of every four and five times he was bringing pressure during the regular season, it was 43.9% of the time, Adam. So basically he, he uh, reduced his blitz package by 50% and he upped his quarter package three times the normal amount. And it shows yep. how the giants were basically like the only way that we can do this is keep Kirk cousins throwing these short five to seven yard routes. And let's hope that they get a penalty or they drop a ball or we get a deflection and they got to kick it away. And guess what? It, 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 Worked out so perfectly in the end on that fourth down when Kirk Cousins checks down on a fourth and eight to a three yard pass, and the Giants tackle him out of bounds, and the game is over. That was a microcosm of what Wink Martindale was trying to do the entire game against that yeah. Vikings offense. Yeah, yeah, it, it really was, and you saw a lot of it during the Vikings game. The passing off of assignments, it, you know, as as uh, I was going to say, AJ Brown. As you have Jefferson working his way through his routes, you saw linebackers slide a little bit to the right and then bite back down towards the quarterback in the line of scrimmage. You saw safeties come in late on those pass route combinations. Like there was a very, it's a one-on-one -on -one assignment at times, but also everyone should probably have half an eyeball on this guy. And they're going to need to repeat the same thing uh, in this game, specifically with A.J. Brown. And then again, just one eye on it. And it's funny, the, the Philadelphia Eagles wide receiver group in totality – is better and more dangerous, I would say overall, right? Because even now Osborne is a dangerous like third option here. But A.J. Brown and Devonta Smith right now, well, boy, it's interesting, right? I think A.J. Brown is quality, high quality enough. We, I'm, I'm not, you know, saying he's not great. It's like Justin Jefferson, the best receiver in the game. A.J. But Brown's top the, 10. He's a top 10 receiver. And you'd say and, Devonta Smith is a top 20, 20 something receiver. So like and, in the two yeah, of them. And, yeah. and the difference is like, where did Adam Thielen fall in this category, right? He's a little bit older. He's losing a step. Whereas these guys for Philadelphia are ascending. The other area where it bounces out though, I think is listen, will I be upset 
if I look over at a stat sheet and I find a guy like Dallas Goddard really breaking off a big game against the Giants, yes, I will, because he's incredibly talented. But I got to tell you, man, whether it's Landon Collins or whatever random linebacker you want to put in there, maybe it's going to be some Julian Love. We talk about now with Xavier McKinney fully back, you do have a real versatility in this safety pseudo linebacker combination role, whatever. They better be able to shut that down while still paying the right attention to A.J. Brown and to Smith, right? Like there needs to be a one-on-one assignment in this that limits what the tight ends are doing for Philadelphia. Because I do think you need to take something off the board here. And it was easier to say against Minnesota, let's take Jefferson off the board. If Hawkinson's going to eat, that's okay. But again, I think you have that second still very dangerous weapon in Smith that makes it hard to go with that same strategy here against Philly. So I'll take it a step further. Against the Minnesota Vikings, they took Justin Jefferson away and said, we're going to play quarters. We're we're not going to blitz very much. And the reason why the Giants were able to do that is because of Minnesota's lack of run game. The whole thing was predicated on the run game. Dalvin Cook had 15 rushes for 60 yards. That's it. Four yards of carry. Didn't really have any big plays to like open up the defense at all. And so when Leonard Williams and Dexter Lawrence are are able to stop the run while having seven defensive backs on the field all at once, yeah. it shows that that basically the Giants were dictating what was happening. I know that they gave up 24 points and it early it looked pretty pretty rough with Kirk Cousins just marching down the field. But as the game went on, the Giants were saying, no, 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 we're going to play seven defensive backs. Get us out of this look by running the football. You can't do it. And they literally could not do it. This is where I worry against the Eagles and where I think the Giants are going to make different changes is we're not going to be able to play seven defensive backs because of guys like Miles Sanders and because the threat of Jalen Hurts running is significantly more than yeah. anything Kirk Cousins has to offer in that department. That's the big difference here. I mean, you said it, right? Like Dalvin Cook, hey, the Giants contained them. Right. And, and did a pretty good job against them in the in the regular season meeting as well. And that's because now we said the Giants defensively have struggled all year to fully shut down running games. But Dexter Lawrence has been just progressively and steadily getting better. Go back and watch it. The center who came back, Bradbury, off the injury for the Vikings. Dexter Lawrence literally just took him and physically threw him on the ground. I mean, he is playing at another level right now. And you get Leonard Williams, hopefully as healthy as he's been. Right. So there's these things that can move the needle here from a one on one standpoint. But whether it is, you know, who's the combination inside of that linebacking room, you need to utilize Landon Collins. You need to, again, I'm going to keep bringing up Julian Love because I'll probably say you could use him here and over there and maybe down there and pick up, you know, a rep here because you need to be able to deploy your best players. But it's going to come down to containing the initial running game and then also trying to mitigate Jalen Hurts and his legs because this this is the different element from the Minnesota Vikings and Kirk Cousins, right? When you execute your game plan initially, the Vikings don't have a lot that they then go to. And it doesn't mean they're not good and they're not dangerous and all those things, but either it's working or it's not. Either Dalvin Cook starts to go off or he doesn't. If the Giants bracket A.J. Brown, if they go quarters and Smith can't quite get going and they're doing a good job against Goddard and Miles Sanders is struggling a little bit and then Bart and it's Scott, they get them off the field completely. I don't said Bart Scott, don't worry about it, it's Boston. But if all that's going well, just like with the Giants having Daniel Jones, Son of a bitch. There goes Jalen Hurts for a 15-yard scramble to pick up a key third down conversion, right? And that is the biggest difference here and why you said, Wink Martindale, yeah, you can do some of the things that you maybe did in Minnesota, but you're going to have to have far more of a spy implementation here watching Jalen Hurts because otherwise, I think, again, early in the game too, those little chunk plays, those back-breaking moments that extend drives for Philadelphia. Yeah, uh, 100%. And so the way that I'm thinking about this also, Adam, is when when you look at the first game that the Giants played against the Philadelphia Eagles on December 11th, Jalen Hurts with his legs was tremendous. He had seven rushes for 77 yards and a touchdown. He was rushing it at 11 yards a clip, and he was picking up big chunk plays. The Giants had no answer for that because then all of a sudden you start putting people in the box and you have single coverage for A.J. Barron and Devonta Smith. That's the real conundrum that the Giants would find themselves in. Now, when we think about week 18, yes, the Giants rested their starters, but there was a lot of good nuggets to be able to get from that game. One being, huh, how Jalen Hurts decided to run the ball, knowing that he was a little dinged up and was a little bit worried. He rushed 
nine times for 13 yards, Adam. One of those was an eight-yard rush, and so the rest of them was five yards on all of the other rushes that he had. Yep. Granted, he was sliding down early to make sure he was not getting contacted in his shoulder, but you can see the difference. If he is not using his legs effectively, if he is not really moving the chains on the ground for them, they lose a dimension, and they really don't become as an explosive as they normally are. So when you yep. look at what we could see from Week 18 – don't you think it kind of circles squarely on like how many rushing yards is Jalen Hurts going to have? Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. And you said it, that's, that's the idea of, you know, we want to close out on was the giants don't play hardly any of their starters in that week 18 matchup. It's all the backups. And that's why we look at Cordell flock combined with that play at the end of Minnesota last week and say, Hey, maybe this guy is here to be this little kind of surprise weapon on the defensive side of the ball and make a big impact. But you have to be able to look at the fact that you took on the starters for Philadelphia in a game that they absolutely had to win, and you played it tight. You were in a one-possession game late, right? Like, and, and what was a big critical part about that? Field goal after field goal for the Philadelphia Eagles, right? You frustrated them enough having what? One in the first quarter, two in the second quarter, and then one in each of the final two quarters as well. Like That, that mattered tremendously. And if you think that running some of those bubble looks defensively where it is about, I've got six guys that whether it's Sanders, whether it's Boston Scott, whether it's Jalen Hurts that can get after that if they choose to break off a run, if they choose to try to get to the edge, that can be a significant difference here. And we, we're not, I'm looking past this here because we have two more days to break this down. But I'll tell you right now, Kayvon Thibodeau is critical in everything the Giants want to do here defensively, obviously. But it's critical to him, and we've seen this development from the beginning of the year. He went from being a guy that was hesitant to fully go downhill to get into the backfield, to break up a running play, to get a quarterback before he runs an RPO option, and trying to make sure that he was covering, you know, serving both masters, right? Getting out to the outside and also being ready to make a big play in the backfield. Over the back end of the season, instinctual, getting aggressive, moving quickly at those balls. And we saw even in the Minnesota game, he did a great job going full board, trying to get to Kirk Cousins, and then turning around and getting all the way back out onto the edge to shut down a running play before it could have broken off for a 5, 7, or 12-yard gain. Ended up getting it for a 3-yard gain there. I can't remember. I think it was on Cook. But did a really good job with that. He, he's going to be critical, man. They've moved him around from either side of the line. Ojolari is dinged up here. Like it, It's going to fall on him to deploy in critical moments a level of execution and mental acuity that you usually don't throw on to a rookie, but they're going to need that because that can be the difference between third down conversions and punts. And that can be the difference between six point drives going for touchdowns versus having to settle for field goals. If you're Philly at the end of the day, yeah, Adam, yeah, we yeah. talked a There's lot a bug in here, Andy. <laughs> we, we talked a lot about the New York giants defense and wing Martindale against the Philadelphia offense. Keep in mind, this is a top 10 in points per game defense for the Philadelphia Eagles. They are number one in yards per game uh, given up against. So they give up the least amount. They're number one in yards per attempt given up against. They stifle offenses tremendously, especially through the air. What we'll do tomorrow is we'll go through the other side of the ball, the other matchup in terms of how can Daniel Jones over his career performance against the Vikings take a lot of those different schemes and things he did really mm -hmm. well and apply it to a better defense in the Philadelphia Eagles in primetime on Saturday night in Philadelphia. Yeah. Darius Slay, obviously, right? James Bradbury, obviously, right? A different beast that the Giants are going to be taking on. And to Andy's point, that's where we'll flip our attention. This is about what they could accomplish disrupting this offense and all of these weapons tomorrow. How does Daniel Jones have a repeat performance? How do key players step up once again? Because for the most part, everybody checked their box against Minnesota. So you need exactly that and probably a little bit more against Philly. We'll start to break that down tomorrow on the show. You get over to YouTube. You enjoy the podcast. You absorb it in any form or fashion that you want. You share it. You like it. You love it. You review it and all those other good things. But until next time, my friends, as Andrew Makowitz would want, need, and nay, demand the people know. As always, let's go Big Blue.